All right, so we are now uh, moving through chapter 9, The Animal Kingdom, in Arthur Young's uh, great book, The Reflexive Universe. Um, I do have some problems with this particular chapter, though. Certain things, I think, start to fall apart. Um, let's glance at our grid so we can see uh, where we left off. Take a look here. Okay, so this is the grid, and um, so we're down at the Animal Kingdom, which is the next to last one, and going across there, then uh, Arthur has single-celled organisms, such as amoebae and uh, paramecium's, and then uh, representing the principle of potential for the animal kingdom, and then the principle of binding are uh, things like cells, or rather sponges, creatures like uh, sponges, which are many cells. So we move from unicellular organisms to uh, multicellular organisms, and then with the principle of identity, we move to the cylenterates, which invent one organ, namely the stomach, and the stomach becomes the central sort of organ for the animal. And then as we move into the principle of combination, we have many organs for creatures like mollusks and flatworms and so forth. Uh, they have many organs. And then with uh, the, for the principle of growth, we have annelids, which are the worm-like creatures that have one chain. So this, is the, uh, this corresponds to the growth principle in the, at the molecular level of polymerization and at the plant level of the segmented cal calamites um, that grew into 90-foot tall trees during the uh, Carboniferous. Uh, and then, so that's a chain. An analyte is a chain, kind of like a centipede or, or creatures of that sort. And then so for arthropods, we get the principle of mobility, uh, which are chains with side chains. And then finally, representing the principle of dominion for the animal kingdom, we get uh, the chordata or the vertebrates. Okay, so let's take a look at Arthur's model then in terms of uh, the substages in detail, starting with his first substage. Now the animal differs from the plant in that it has, re remember, two degrees of freedom because it, can, uh, it has the freedom of choice to move voluntarily, and that's the key thing for Arthur Young, voluntarily in a, two, in a 360 degree radius in any direction, whereas uh, the plant has only one degree of freedom because it grows uh, straight up vertically and that's it for its it just has this heliotropism it goes wherever the sunlight is um, but as he says here um, the plant growth is movement toward an indefinitely remote goal which is in a constant direction whereas the animal movement is toward specific and attainable goals water food a mate shelter and in any direction and so, as we start then here with the um, first substage that corresponds to the principle of potential, we have basically what are now known as protists, which represent the second kingdom after bacteria. So the five kingdoms officially are bacteria, protists, fungi, and then plants and animals. So the difference between those first two kingdoms is that the bacteria are prokaryotic. That is to say, they don't have uh, nuclei, no, no nuclei. But once a nucleus forms, and I'm sure it formed uh, as a defense mechanism against viruses, uh, once it does form, now we have eukaryotes, and so we have protists. And the earlier protists were uh, still unicellular, um, like some of these characters here that, uh, let's take a look, uh, the, this paramecium is a single-celled organism. Um, it has a micronucleus and a macronucleus. Uh, still single-celled, but it is it is now a protist. Um, and this creature too, the foraminifera. The foraminifera are kind of they're kind of interesting because it's hard to believe that they're single-celled organisms, but they are. But notice, and Young points this out, that they've already invented the principle of the spiral that will later be used for calcium shells uh, with mollusks and and creatures of that sort. All right, so then moving along here on Arthur's model, uh, the next stage of binding is, uh, the principle of binding is represented by sponges, which are very strange creatures who have now given up mobility. Um, they root themselves to the ocean floor. They give up mobility, kind of recapitulating plants in that sense uh, for, for bulk, uh, for mass, and therefore represent the multicellular principle of binding. So we move 
from unicellular to multicellular. So keep in mind how Young is organizing his model here. And here we have uh, uh, the life cycle of sponges. They're, they're kind of strange, actually. They, they sort of they can reproduce either asexually uh, on the left over there, like a, a bud can come off of it and then root to the sea floor, or they can reproduce sexually as well. Uh, in this cycle here, you see the egg cell and the sperm cell, uh, sort of the organism self-fertilizing, combining uh, and creating an embryo uh, and a new, a new sponge. So it can reproduce either, either way. It's kind of interesting how it does that. All right, so then moving to Arthur's third substage, uh, which is Celenterates. And Celenterates now uh, invent the stomach. Um, it's a single organ. So we move from the unicellular world of the, of the protists to, or the unicellular world of the uh, bacteria and uh, some, some protists to the multicellular world of more protists type creatures to these cylindrates now, which have only one organ, which is to say a stomach. Uh, a hydra has a mouth. And let's take a look at a better image of a hydra that I've found here. It has a mouth. Um, and uh, the, the entire interior basically is a stomach and it's called a hydra because it has these tentacles at the top, uh, like the character in Greek myth that Hercules had to fight. And uh, so that's an example of uh, one of the creatures from that level. And now, so let's look at uh, the principle of creatures with many organs now, not just one organ, but many organs. And this represents the fourth substage, which is that of combination. And so uh, here we have flatworms, nematodes, snails, clams, an argonaut, a starfish, uh, and a squid. So we have all these, as in the case of his x-ray diagram there of the squid, they have all these organs, but they're not arranged hierarchically yet. And here, I think, is where the model starts to break down. And I think you can, you can tell that by the, the heterogeneity of the creatures that he's got here. He really wants this to follow his model. And as I said last time, Arthur Young is a spatial thinker. And his view of evolution is the way an engineer would look at evolution as a machine. He's not looking at it as it actually happened in terms of the evolutionary uh, sequence. Uh, let's look at one more stage here. His next stage are the uh, annelids, which are the fifth substage, uh, which represent chains now, polymerization, uh, worms of various sorts, uh, this Nereus creature, whatever it is. And then there's a diagram here. Uh, contrast this with the diagram of the squid off to the lower left there, where now there's a principle of a hierarchical organization of the organs. We have the mouth, the brain, the pharynx, the heart, the esophagus, crop, gizzard, intestine, and anus. Uh, so it's all there. And then let's get to the next kingdom here before things get a little rough for Arthur's model, I'm afraid. Uh, here we have uh, the sixth substage representing the principle of mobility, uh, which is chains with side chains. So notice here that He's got a trilobite, which he has ripped from the Cambrian epoch, next to a crab, which didn't evolve until much, much later. Next, and then down below, dragonflies and spiders, which didn't evolve until the Carboniferous period. Um, all these creatures are from different epochs. So this is a spatial thinker's way of representing evolution, and it has nothing to do with the reality of the way animals uh, evolved on this earth. It just, there's no correspondence whatsoever. So let's take a look at the geological model, um, which I think is correct for the most part. Uh, it's a far different experience. Now, last time we saw that uh, Young basically got it right with the plants um, in terms of his model, and it just happened to coincide with the evolution of plants over time, which culminated during the Cretaceous with flowering plants, the uh, angiosperms. But th this model doesn't work. <laughs> it just doesn't. And we'll see why here for the, for the animal evolution. So this, these are the three early epochs, the Hadean, the Archean, and the Proterozoic. Uh, the origins of the Earth are 4.6 billion down to 4 billion years for the Hadean epoch when the moon is formed. 
and water is brought to the earth by asteroids, the uh, frozen ice crystals that melt, then create the ocean. Um, this is called the late heavy bombardment, which goes from 4.1 billion years ago to 3.8 billion years ago or so. And it's in the Archean Epoch, which is 4 billion to about 2.5 billion years ago, that life first emerges, the earliest bacteria, the prokaryotes. We get methanogenic uh, bacteria. We get um, cyanobacteria, which invent photosynthesis. So they create an oxygen catastrophe because with CO2 molecules, they're only interested in the carbon. So they let the oxygen, the, the O2 goes, and it goes up and turns the sky blue. Before that, it would have been it would have looked like the sky of Mars, brown basically. The sky turns blue, and uh, we get atmospheric oxygen. And then in the Proterozoic epoch, now we get the eukaryotes about two billion or so years ago, single-celled eukaryotes like the Paramecium that we saw. And then next we get multicellular eukaryotes. So life is getting more and more ambitious here as it goes along. Um, and then of course the colonization of the land. Um, Let's take a look at the Cambrian timeline here. Um, the Cambrian basically picks up on the time scale where that model leaves off 540 million years ago. Uh, down at the bottom there on the left we have, there's the Cambrian. Then it's followed by the Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian, the Carboniferous. Uh, and we're going to say something about each of, each of these in a moment. Uh, the Permian, uh, up to the Carboniferous. The, the Permian, uh, then there's the Permo-Triassic disaster that wiped out 99.9% .9 of all living things. And then that cleared the stage for the dinosaurs. Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, then they're wiped out by an asteroid, which clears the stage for the Cenozoic rise of mammals. All right. Um, so now um, the Cambrian explosion is, is an interesting phenomenon. Take a look at what animals sort of look like just before uh, this is 630 million years ago. Uh, it's called the Ediacaran Epoch. These are kind of boring uh, creatures, little like little mini je jellyfish and uh, maybe some sponges in there and some creatures that look like leaves um, sort of waving in the tides. Um, this is 630 million years ago. So these are sort of like the earliest actual animals that, that we could call animals. But then with the Cambrian explosion, something mysterious happens, a, a major, major uh, mutation. And these are Cambrian arthropods now. Here they come 540 million years ago. Um, you, uh, every one of these creatures uh, you could hold in the palm of your hand, and trilobites aren't on here because I suppose they're a cliche, uh, but you could hold every one of these in the palm of your hand, except for the T-Rex the here, the Anomalocaris, which was three feet long, and was the predator here who was preying on all these other creatures and probably also on uh, the first fish. So let's take a look at Cambrian vertebrates, which note appear right alongside arthropods. Um, here are the earliest fish. Now I believe that uh, the fish on the top there, so we have uh, Hycoichthys, Mylocomgia, and, um, uh, that's, and Pacaya. I, I think the one on the top is, is Pacaya gracilans. And um, Pisces, of course, means fish. But notice how much it looks like a worm. And I believe what happened is that the worm traded out its radial symmetry for, the, for a flattening, a bilateral symmetry. And that's how fish emerged. So that's the line that we come out of, not the line of arthropods. And I believe that the history of evolution has been uh, a war between arthropods and vertebrates. Um, and here you can sort of see this unfolding if you look at Let's take a look at Ordovician fish, uh, which come in the next epoch. All these fish are very small, um, all of them. You can hold all these basically in the palm of your hand. They don't have jaws. They have sort of sucker mouths or little filter mouths, uh, but they don't have jaws. And as a result of that, they can't get access to a better uh, meat supply, a better protein supply. So they're being preyed upon by monstrosities like the brontoscorpions. Um, and here are two very large brontoscorpions, um, one of them preying upon uh, one of the fish. This Obviously, this is a fish with, with a jaw, so, so this is uh, an anachronism from a later epoch. But it illustrates the principle of what was going on in this war between uh, arthropods and vertebrates. 
So the fish have the brilliant idea of inventing the jawbone during this, the next epoch, the Silurian epoch. And here you can see now they have a jawbone. And the jawbone simply is a gill bone that has been transformed and moved forward and turned into a mandible, basically a, a lower jawbone. Um, and not with teeth at first, it's just a, a serrated jawbone. Now they get bigger and bigger. They, they can start eating more and more food, which allows them to get bigger and bigger. And pretty soon, by the next epoch, they now have the upper hand. Um, here's this monstrosity, Dunkleosteus from the Devonian epoch. Um, now, with the invention of that jawbone, it changed the entire history of the vertebrate line. Um, th these things were gigantic. And so now the Anomalocaris T. rex, predator at the top of the food chain from the Cambrian, by the time of the Devonian, millions of years later, has been uh, traded out for a vertebrate at the top of the food chain. But we haven't heard the last from arthropods yet because during the Carboniferous, we have the largest insects uh, that we've ever had. The Carboniferous had a lot more oxygen in the atmosphere uh, than we have at this time, which uh, the um, biologists think account for the size of these monstrosities. As you can see, the millipede there is as large as a man. Um, the scorpions were as large as dogs, and the dragonflies were about the size of kites. Uh, maybe a even a little larger, um, and reptiles were coming in, but they were they were much smaller, and I think the arthropods were the, were preying on the reptiles. So note the problem with Arthur's model is that he has this idea that the arthropods somehow are before or earlier than, though it doesn't say that, but the model implies that that earlier than uh, vertebrates, whereas we have just seen. Going all the way back in the Cambrian explosion, vertebrates and arthropods uh, emerged at exactly the same time and have been in contention through all of these geological epochs, even down to the present day. Um, this explains our, our disgust and distaste for insects. There's a reason why uh, we don't like them. We've been in a struggle with them for a long, long, long time. And so for Arthur's last stage, the Dominion stage here, he throws in vertebrates um, this jumbled uh, heap here of birds, mammals, amphibians, uh, fish. Um, none of it makes any sense. None of it corresponds to anything that actually unfolded in evolution, except for the principle that uh, he is right that through evolution, it has gotten more ambitious, more cells, more organs. The forms have gotten larger and uh, more complex. So he's right about that. But in terms of these falling into his categories, where it has to move for him from unicellular to multicellular to one organ to many organs to polymerization to chains with side chains to uh, the vertebrates um, with their dominion because of the nervous system uh, and its freedom. The nervous system gives, this is the utmost freedom that is given to an organism is to have a nervous system where there's an autonomic part of the nervous system, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic uh, that runs your basic you know, blood circulation, digestion, movement of the bowels, and then the voluntary nervous system, which is the key thing that makes this for Young the dominion level of his model. Maybe so, maybe vertebrates are at the top. Uh, I suspect so, yes, but his model does not take into account how mammals then evolve out of reptiles, how amphibians have evolved out of fish, uh, how it actually happened. Uh, it's just a spatial thinker's version of evolution, and I don't think it, that it works very well. Uh, it certainly doesn't work as well as his plant model did. Um, so we'll leave it there. Uh, the next kingdom is the human kingdom, the dominion kingdom uh, altogether, uh, and we'll look and see what he has to say about the transformations of human consciousness.